Greetings ladies and mentalgens and welcome to this patch video for There is No Epic Lucha Holy Puns from Royal Road containing chapters 106 to 108 and as always I hope that you enjoy There is No Epic Lucha Holy Puns Chapter 106 Delta The Darkest Dungeon Delta had a hand to her mouth hiding her grin when no one could actually see her seemed silly, but in her own mind, Nalta just didn't like being rude. Her aspiring raiding party was here at last. To be honest, they were exactly what Dalta needed before taking the rest of the silence. The reminder that good and light existed, the innocence of children, the reason why Dalta had developed the way she had, and the budding potential of the life outside of the dungeon. Oh, and Grim was here as well. She wondered what to do as they talked about their strategy. She didn't listen, so as that would be cheating, but she was happy to see Kemi still participating. The sight of Kemi and Dio together as friends made her giddy enough to float in a bliss for a few moments. New would be lurking on the lower floors, all through the challenge windows. It reminded Delta to create more challenges for the second floor. The group spread out and examined the signpost popped up by New. He had gotten uh, creative with his words recently. Getting is bad. If you need to learn morals from a dungeon sign, this won't end well. There are no traps in this dungeon. Honest. Mushrooms are sacred. Please praise them for better luck in this dungeon. Remember, there is no I in team, so have no original thought and pretend that you're a lemming. Yeah. New had only gotten more into his sign-making hobby over time. Delta wasn't sure that she would ever be happy that he, too, was getting part of her Earth knowledge. But she decided that it would make for some good inside jokes and enjoy it down the line. As usual, everyone dropped something more into the tribute balls. I drew you a picture of Rudy catching a dragon and then riding it right after its wing. It's called Harvey the Dragon, and Rudy loves him. Dio explained calmly as he placed the piece into the ball. Delta was going to frame the damn thing above the bar. Kemi put in a few cupcakes. I bought these from the local cheese man. He's nice, and I think either his cheese may be reaching forbidden levels in the kingdom, or he may be highly wanted criminal who traumatized the king. Kemi explained, sounding more faint as she went on. Grim snorted. Aldi is just a harmless guy. He made me cheesecake when I got the ups, no, uh, too focused, on my training for my tenth birthday. Nice, but he always seemed like he was far away until recently. Grim said Kemi hummed as she thought about it. If this area was only just gotten mana back, powerful people would have faded to the shells of themselves faster than plain average folk. Haldi might have just been suffering from mana drain to keep the pressure off of everyone else and to give you kids enough to grow. She theorized as she smoothed down her cloudy robe. Haldi... Delta wondered if it was like Quiss and Davagost. Delta wouldn't mind meeting him at least. His cheese sounded magical. Kids, you're hardly more mature. You're hanging out with us, Grim reminded. Kemi blankly looked at the beaming Dio. Not of free will. I'm no hostage, but I'm too scared to leave in case I upset him, she mumbled. Lady, we're all here because of that, except Poppy. I think she actually likes him, Grim admitted. Amonster put in some holy water, Vass put in a vase, and Poppy finished by putting in a few old books. Grim eyed them for a few moments, sticking his tongue out, and Dalta was surprised to see that it was a bright orange. She peered at it with a dungeon sight. Grim looked like mostly normal, except for the tongue, which became filled with orange manner, mixed in with his own. Symbols impossible to see with the human eye danced across Grim's tongue, and Dalta got a headache just for looking at it. She had no doubt that a notification would have appeared if Sis hadn't turned the menus off to prevent infection via Little Brother's spores. Delta had been a core long enough to guess that she lacked understanding or close enough bonds with Grimm to fully understand the ruins on his tongue. Oh no! What a shame, Grimm is such a nice boy! Delta grunted out loud. At that time, Mushi appeared in the tunnel and pleased expression. Honor guest, welcome, welcome. I see you are all eager to begin your harsh raid into the dungeons below. He rumbled as his moustache twitched. 
No one spoke, but Dio was nodding with excitement as Poppy repeated the words. It seemed that the boy had trouble reading Mushy's words without an actual mouth to read. That kind of sucked for Dio. Delta wanted to think of some way to help Mushy, noticed first. He began to move one hand in a series of rotations with subtle finger flicking. It was sign language, but some very mini version of it. Ah, right, the universal translator. If Dio had any signs with his parents, the dungeon would know it. Being a dungeon is kind of cheating in the most service-minded way possible, she mumbled. I wonder if we can communicate with the blind, deaf, and mute people with various mixes. Like if a blind, deaf, mute girl came in, would I just telepathically be connected to her, or would we soul speak? What are my limits? Nalta said as she eyed her own hands. I can pun in any language, and I can feign ignorance. I must abuse this, she said seriously. Before we begin, some ground rules, and then we can be on our way, yes? Mushy looked around pleasantly. Mother would like you all to only take the first floor today, and only spend some time on the second floor to adjust to the manor to make sure that there are no uh, incidents. Mushy eyed Grim, amused. Makes sense, even if I get sick if we go too deep too fast, Kemi said shyly. Delta wanted to pinch her cheeks at awe and cooing noises. Second roar, Mushy went on, ignoring the fuming Grim and smoking Amonster. The bar is a rest zone and not a combat zone. Waddles' room is empty for the moment, so you can also rest there if you wish. Mother would like to also say that my adorable little brother's room will also be a rest spot, but cannot be forced that one. I dare to say that it would be more healthy not to challenge Maestro. Mushi chuckled. Kemi turned her head. Maestro? Kemi echoed. Her eyes lit up for a moment. Was that the singing voice? she asked. And Dio nodded. He's so cool. He can make my mum want to sing, he boasted. He is also a mushroom creature like yourself, Amonster asked politely. Dio's smile faded a little. Well, you could say he's like Mr. Mushy, he deflected. Poppy hugged a book to her chest, and Delta felt something odd from it, like a slight nagging tug. She was almost tempted to push them to Maestro, but she shouldn't be trying to traumatize kids. Mushy went on. All within the dungeon have been informed to use the least lust force as possible. He began, and Grim narrowed his eyes. You're treating us with kid gloves. I may need artifacts and tricks, but Dio is going to blow them away. He's as strong as he is sincere and annoying, Grim demanded. Amonster and Poppy looked at him blankly until he sighed. Poppy can either be scary or need a sled to get to her anyway. An Amonster can call down Holy Wrath, but he's wasting his skill by raising mouse skeletons because he's gothic, or something. Grim said with a grunt, Oh, you're a necromancer, Gemi blinked at Amonster, who was decked from head to toe in black with skull rings on his hands. Is that going to be a problem with your deity? Amonster asked slowly instead of answering. Gemi shook her head. I'm a follower of truth, so long as you're honest about why you're using them or where you got the bones. I'm dandy. My goddess isn't like the light of God or life goddess who freaks out over such natural deaths being used. And the ground eats the flesh, the bones, and nature to soil, and the soul passes on. It is no more wicked than using a bone as a weapon or an organ transportation or being a funeral director, she beamed. Oh, that's cool. I was sort of expecting a fight with the priests when they started coming. Amister went pink at Kemi's words. She nodded as if sympathizing. Many will try to demonize you, but all you need to do is state that your power is with the dead isn't even religious. It's just advanced calciomancy. Or, if it's religious, it's covered by the Kingdom's Equal Worship Act of recent years, so long as the religion does not harm, devour, or enslave the living, or harm the soul in any way, then it's not be to be persecuted, Demi said with a smile. Oh, Delta needed to show Amonster the circus if he likes skeletons. Religious sounds fun, but I cannot join one, Vass said suddenly as everyone looked at him. I have no soul, and make very poor follower, he said blandly. I will ask Delta if she can make you a soul. She makes everything in her own home feel like a person. Dio said cheerfully. 
Dalta added playing card and making soul to please Dio on her list of things to do. Indeed, Mother is quite talented at accidentally making wondrous things. You are free to fight at full power, but please do not kill where you can avoid it. We shall respawn, but it is unpleasant. For that matter, all contract monsters will stay out of the fight, as they are costly to resummon. Mushi went on. I'm not sure that I can fight you now that you've been so kind. Dungeons just sort of try to kill me, but this place is so nice. Kami said suddenly. Mushi chuckled more and more. I am to be your, uh, bench, so to speak. If someone is injured or needs help, I shall carry your belongings and yourselves to the rest spot for first aid and treatment. I will not help you or fight or complete the puzzles, however, he told her kindly. This seemed to relieve some of the tension in the room, but then Grub stepped up to the mushroom man. I remember you. You sold pots and looked different. I... Listen, Grum looked down, jaw twitching as he fought to keep speaking. I'm sorry. I tried to stab you and insulted your art. I treated you like a dumb animal and not a person. I was a bit of a Grum first-timer. He said and snapped his mouth closed. Dio blinked and began to laugh with joy. Kemi was shocked at his words. Dalta. Dalta was bent over, slapping her knee. Grum, Grum, Grum first. She was howled at hoots and laughter. No, listen, that's my curse. It's really, how would you say it, a slip of the tongue. He protested and then looked furious at himself. Delta hooted even harder, despite the fact that she might have done this to Grimm. She actually found it a hilarious form of punishment for the little brat. Mushi leaned down to put a hand on Grimm's shoulder. I bear no ill will. I even found it very impressive on how far you managed to get with the cunning and skill. He praised. Grim took a long moment to answer. Well, 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 of course, I didn't plan for nothing. I just am glad that someone can appreciate it. He shook off Mushi's hand briskly. I always appreciate your ambushes, Dio said as he looked between Grim and Mushi. They never worked. You can't praise failure, Grim turned, waving his hands. I think that we should begin. Most of you have a curfew and I'm supposed to be chaperoning. Kemi spoke. Mushi bowed slightly and gestured to the dark tunnel, where the glow of moss on the ceiling was barely illuminating the past. Dio, you're in front, Costas in the back and Poppy at the rear. She can use her physical powers to act as a temp tank. Grum spoke, voice turning deadly serious. Dio looked at him for a long time, his usual smile missing. I, front DPS warrior, am ready, and I will look for traps. Dio said with a serious nod. Grim stared at him for a long moment and then gulped grimly. Thank you, GPS, he said ever so quietly. Shame Dalta had absolute hearing in a dungeon as she wanted. They then took the first steps forward into the dark tunnel. The court was eager. The new game had been suggested to them by the great webmother. The mock war. It was so exciting to turn the fancy web wigs and instead be dressed and run around in crafted hooded web cloaks and sharpened little rocks that they had convinced themselves were deadly assassin knives. The dungeon was also an exciting place, but the court was rarely so involved. Given that they would attack and try to take down the invaders with their blunted weapons and light whites, it was something that they had to make plans for. The first important thing was their name. They couldn't be royal court of these uniforms. They had totally the wrong regalia for such a task. They were the shadows, the fangs of the night. They were the string that loosed the evil of the world. And no secrets could escape their eight eyes. They were the fantastic agency of notorious grandeur spiders. They all made excited dances at the declaration, since they were now a democracy in the guise. Votes for all. Dio easily dodged the pop-out sign that had grown used to its many attempts. Grim glared at it before striding forward, and his head thunked against the sign that popped out of the ceiling. Confidence leads to arrogance, it read. Dio liked new. He had a funny sense of humor. Turning the corner, with Grim having waving his hands frantically in front of him to ward off any more funny signs. 
They came to an eerie sight of the room ahead of them, covered in lines of webs. The usual open passage was now a maze of sticky web once more. Don't set it on fire, Kimmy shouted in a hurried warning. Poppy eyed the passage. Could make it easier if we were supposed to be trying. She looked at him a little more alive, but kept her voice blank. Amundster frowned as he held a hand out. I am getting something. It feels really weird, like the room is all connected by a life pond. Like if they share health or a trap trigger. I don't know. He opened his eyes. Dio liked that about Amundster. He could detect cool living things by trying. And when they went looking for bugs or homework subjects, Amundster could always sense them so easily. It was actually how they became friends. Amundster said that he found Dio blocked out the light by being a light of his own. Dio had always taken this as a compliment. If you burn the spiders down, a boss emerges and it has a puppet-like powers over everyone. Kemi said to them, Amundster nodded slowly. Sounds close to what I felt. You fought against the boss? The boy asked, looking at Kemi impressed. The girl went pink and fiddled with her earmuffs. Not exactly. We got punished and moved on, she answered finally. Grim approached the hall and a blue box appeared. Dio smiled at it. It was so cool to see Delta's dungeon doing awesome things. It listed the No Touching the Web Challenge. It was available, but if they wished for a legitimate challenge as requested, then to ignore the web challenge to try to conquer the room, as adventurous with a sword sized too big and a brain sized too small would do. We'll cut the web from the front door, take down or deflect the threats, but don't rush in spiders or masters of their own domain. Grim said, Dio nodded while Kemi just gave him an odd look. You know that I'm a venturer, right? She reminded. Grim actually did wince a little, but he swung his sword down onto the first layer of webs. Some snapped, some frayed, some clung to the sword, but the entire room vibrated like a fantastical piece of music. The room sized harp. They waited for Amster peered in. I don't see any response, he began, but a little spider wearing a long, flowing cloak of web latched onto his face and a cape of red thread sewn into a spell something. The Crimson Tea Stealer! Dio stared in glee, his eyes glittering at the sight of the ninja spider. It scuttled around Poppy and aimed her book, which actually talked in warning not to use it as a weapon, and it smashed at the spider. The thing was quick and all Amster saw was a heavy book flying towards him. There was a loud crack as Amster's nose was bent crooked. The spider fled back into the room, carrying one of Amster's eyelashes. The death user stared up, eyes narrowed as he flicked his hands over his face. Dio knew noses didn't have a bone, but he watched as he corrected itself with another sharp crack. I suggest we smoke them out. It isn't fire. Amster said ever so calmly, still laying on the floor. You know priest spells? Kemi asked curiously. Poppy was holding a furious book at arm's length and went on about powerful spells and souls sold to him for a moment of this time, as Amister stood up. My dad is a saint. I was born sneezing blessings and causing my toes to ward off evil. He explained, and Grim stared. Why aren't you in a mass of pain? he demanded. Amister looked right at him. The pain in the back of my soul is beyond measure. Here, mortal wounds are lost on me. Dio thought about it and then smiled. Gravely, he had to tell Delta that one later. He also knows how to use necromancy to deaden the nerves of small time. He's just cheating, Poppy told them bluntly. Poppy, stop ruining my goth. Yeah. We'd be ready if it wasn't for the creepy kid. Zane complained. Her hull merely chewed on the dark root. Her eyes glazed over as she walked eyeing the another village in the distance, so unaware of the dangerous nights passing so close. We can't all be born monsters. He's gotten much faster. The woman disagreed. They looked behind them at the ball training limp bloody leg, which was mending before their eyes. Even healing faster. I told you that leaving that monster alive for him to fight was good practice. Hull giggled. Al's face was blank as always, and his eyes blazed at them. You have gained regen level 10. You've absorbed monster essence into the system core. You have 10,459. 
He ignored the rest. It didn't matter. It was getting so damn hard to get stronger. Why was the only decent quest of some backwater hick village? He glared at the lush green monsters. Too strong for him to grind fast. He also must threw out a glinting sword and bounced orange slime to feel stronger than something else. But refrained since it would all make him seem childish. It eyed him from the longest moment and the system could have judged the vague danger threats that gave him a simple message. Death. Alpha moved on as fast as his sprint would allow, even overtaking the two royal guards. Now that's what I'm talking about. Zane roared and began to run. Oh, bother. It was such a nice day, Pohol sighed. Mule bounced happily along. He had thought that if he felt out and the cold red aura of the weakening was lacking. It had no warmth or kindness. It was a human operating on a gutted dungeon system. Sad. Ah, well, he'd find Alta eventually after he went to yell the dungeon. The quest for the fluffy things must be done. Dalza's good mood depended on it. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 107. Love. Troublesome invaders. The mighty, godlike call knew she would have to make sure that these mortal children learned the meaning of fear and darkness. Her monsters stood steady, fierce and focused, only on the destruction. Her deadly traps had been so hidden that even the core knew that she would struggle to find them, her obstacles so designed to crush all hopes and dreams. This dungeon was deserving of the fearsome reputation that it had gained. Soul Taker, Light Taker, the true evil made solid, making unending a full madness. This dungeon was known far and wide as a really nice dungeon, Dio said as he prepared for the second assault. Delta blew out a sigh before she chuckled. Yeah, she was no good at the whole raw, hear Delta raw crap. The group watched as Amminster clapped his hands on little five-mouth skeletons and flowed from the sleeve to rush into the room. Instantly, two of them were tackled by hood-wearing spiders. Go, Grimm said, and Kemi tapped here once, infusing him with a glowing order. Truth will set you free, she declared. I like all the colors. Pie is delicious. All days are equally good, as long as you're having fun. Dio said as he ran and the webs tried to catch him, but the glow pulsed as Dio kept chanting. The thread simply slid off of his form and fell to the floor, uselessly. Delta stared. Fudge! Kemi working on Dio made her truth powers too up. He tapped into the two spiders that were struggling with the mouse skeleton. Dio destiny, touch! You're dead, but not really! He jeered as both spiders immediately rolled up and curled up in their legs. Dio didn't actually have to prove his physical powers. It wasn't like her spiders were as hard as rocks. They were still squishy, so it was fair for them being able to touch them with a considered a kill. And he was jumped by a spider that dived into his loose shirt collar. The boy instantly began to contort and peel off in laughter. DPS is being CC'd, Grum yelled in a panic. Poppy held up her talking book and looking ready to do her duty. I swear to the ancient faceless beings that made my pages. If you use me to swat bugs, I will... I will... I will tell your history of socks. The book cried in alarm. It reminded Delta of New Stuffy and easily upset. The third floor, New paused as his efforts to plot the potential medical wing of the empty laboratory space. He sensed uh, Delta was sassing him. What cheek! He'd have to pop out of nowhere and scare her. The sealed doors that led deeper shook a little. It seemed that they were picking up the pace on their side. It was nothing worth actually being worried about, not something that he would want to ruin Delta Swank with. She was so happy with Dio and his friends that everyone in the dungeon was getting a little Delta high. Happiness had pleased feelings that just came out and went. It was like the seasonal happiness, no known cure. He turned to the gargoyles, who had supplied the doctor with several rare herbs from the second floor. The keen mind, with a hint of madness, went to work, seeing what he could develop as a post of error. The borrower. 
Without a proper lab, it would be limited. But as with all things, you knew that new upgrades ruined the resource supply. But if Farrah could brew and Davina was able to voodoo, then Doctor could always develop ways to cure the flu. It was just a matter of waiting for the other shoe to drop. It would cure the flu, but knew knew that it would also be able to use the stew or cause a drink of Tumu. He should be annoyed, honestly. It was fast becoming a fair trade-off. Insane power, odd side effects. He watched as something exploded in the swirling darkness. That caused the doctor to be thrown across the room. Nu had only given the monster some data blooms and spa water. There was only two spiders left, and the room was devoid of webbing, and Kimmy couldn't see the white spider Muffet anywhere. The two hooded spiders stood against the group, looking ready for a fight. Surrender and let us pass, Grim said seriously. They didn't back down. You guys kind of swish in one hit. Dio sat on one side of you, and that was it, Amundsen pointed out. Dio was looking distraught that Kimmy had to hold him close with one arm. The poor boy felt truly terrible about the act. They all knew logically that the spiders were immortal, in a sense, but Dio didn't seem to see that as a very acceptable reason to not feel bad. Your powers alone are too weak, Grim almost cackled. The boy was getting some serious enjoyment out of his, uh, revenge. Kimmy could almost feel the walls of Delta glaring down at the boy. She hadn't known the dungeon was even able to dislike someone. The spiders shared a look before they hopped back in to gain some space. Kimmy stared, not sure what they were planning to do. Were they going to end themselves and bring Miss Muffet? Kimmy hoped not. They were rather cute with their hoods, and it seemed a shame that they would vanish, even if Miss Muffet was sweet and gave Kimmy her earmuffs. Both spiders raised their single leg in the opposite directions, facing them with steely eyes. They moved in a slight dance towards each other, their legs moving overhead. What are they doing? Grum said, voice almost afraid. The spiders were within touching distance, and they snapped their two legs back out before they had the tips meet each other in perfect mirror of each other. There was a brief pause before the spider on the left hopped, flipping and landing upside down on the other, both spiders interlocking two legs with each other. The new combo had legs in every direction. The spiders pushed off of the ground with enough force to rocket to the ceiling, but with a new form it didn't have much turn to catch themselves. They landed with a perfect crouch before pushing off again in an angled direction. Kemi turned to follow, but barely caught a blur as it rocketed off again. She spun and lost sight of the spiders. Grim gave a startled scream as he was shot past multiple times. A cocoon of waves rapidly forming around him. Poppy reached out with a clawed hand and looked like it belonged in the deep purple skelt creature. Grim fell, freed. The spider combo flew towards her, and she opened a book in a flash, her eyes glowing under the hood. The spiders, unable to stop the trajectory, landed in the middle of the book. Don't you dare! There was a crunch. The webs on the ceiling fluttered, and Kemi looked up slowly. She's here, she whispered in a sudden silence. Not even a special deal. My Rudy was right to call on me. The tall man mused. His body was so thin and the suit looked literally sharp. His head was covered in a large mess of curly black hair. His speech was muffled by a dazzling pink scarf that hid most of his face. He completed the ensemble with the pitch black sunglasses that were designed for creatures with eyes much bigger than a person of happy size should be wearing. He leaned in as his gloved hands together to peer at the items. Hob thought he was a bit weird for a human, but then again, the man was a skeleton pretending to be a human, so maybe Hob didn't know what was weird for this town. Why are you a skinny? Gob peered. Happy laughed loudly. Oh no, my spinach-colored friends, I am very happy, a business manager of several notable companies. He promised and a twig went astray, but Happy fixed it. N not, not breathing? Gob pushed. I am holding my breath in excitement. No eyes behind glasses. They're off busy looking for some good deals. No skin? Losing money is no skin off my nose. No nose. Hob stated with hands up in the air. Happy thought about it. Sticking it where it didn't belong has gotten me into trouble before, so I had to let it go. He admitted cheerfully. Oh, 
that made sense. Gob guessed that the man knew what he was doing then. Glad to see that the suit is still sharp, even after all your jokes aren't. The man sniffed had they appeared next to him. Ah, Smalls, your clothes always make me feel like I'm in the life of the party, he said, shaking the man's hand. The well-dressed man glared. Goblins, don't be fooled, this uh, person has developed many successful businesses. He funds and is the owner of most adventurer branches, funds many top-notch parties, runs a catering company for vampires, ants and bandits, and was the tri-founder of the Fair Play before he sold his shares. Smalls crossed his arms. Hob didn't know any of those words, but it seemed very impressive. Happy shrugged. I have a taste for making something out of the bare bones idea. Call it an itch. I love to scratch. The man's voice turned almost husky. Yes, yes. You funded kings and own seas. Bravo. You still annoy the living daylights out of most everyone. Small snapped and turned to the god. I didn't own seas. Most of them fall of the edge of the world, and my heart would sink at the loss of profits. Happy sighed dramatically. We gotta make profits for Delta, Gob said and happy hummed. Seers would be an odd currency, but I could see if I could predict the positive outcomes of such a business. Happy went quiet, Smalls and Hob shared a look. There was a connection between them, of suffering and headaches. Let's get a stock count, then we'll work on the values of human traffic varieties. Small said, looking like he would rather be somewhere else, but the sight of their business hurt him in some way. Oh, this reminds me of the business I once ran that sold swords, but each piece came separate. I thought it was a fun mix and match deal, but no one seemed to come back, and because trying to defend yourself with a sword guard didn't seem to be working. I did have tickled my funny bone, so it was worth it, Happy announced. Hob had no idea how this non skiddy man was so good at making money. It seemed to waste it on amusement. Wouldn't he need lots of money or treasures to waste if he could do that? Was Muffet too much for the first room? Delta didn't think so, at first, but watching the party being moved around like dolls and strings crashing into walls at each other was interesting. Dio and Gabby were mostly contained in a simple swing, but Grum was spun, twisted and slammed, dropped, crashed into the walls that lifted more than Delta assumed was necessary. Amister began to rot the wobbling and sickly green aura, and Poppy just seemed to begin to become too hot to actually web, so it wasn't like Muffet's powers was unbeatable. Muffet landed on a fully powered spider geist form. She was strong even in physical measures. So she easily swept Amnesty off his feet, vanishing before Poppy could crash down a steel-covered foot. Dio flexed and stretched, freeing himself to help. Gammy was the one who looked the most uncertain. Delta's heart fell for the girl. She and Mufford had gotten along famously. Finally, she began to grant some shields that repulsed Mufford when she tried to land on someone. Grim rolled and got one of Mufford's legs with a swing of his sword. Dio went in with his own blade, but the swing was so off-target that he got stuck in the wall. Muffet limped, and Dalja checked on her. A bit worried. Muffet was in no real pain, while her monsters had basic sensations and the ability to feel a form of pain. It was mostly a guidance thing. Her monsters never felt anything beyond a dull pinch or an ache, physically. Except when other monsters of Dalta did the damage. Then... It was like they shook the very dungeon manner in the form of making the pain lifelike. Delta was glad because she wasn't sure that she could do this pain was a thing. The only exception she had ever found was Fran and her contracts. Contracts because they were creatures once and Fran because... Delta guessed it was because Fran himself wanted to be fair. Then again, Muffet didn't have to reveal herself and her puppet strings could easily become nooses if she really were so inclined. Muffet was making large, obvious movements and letting her camouflage flicker at random moments. She was even coming down from the ceiling to allow Grum and Dio to get close. If someone did come with the intent of trying to kill her or enjoy the monster's suffering, Delta was confident that they would find it tougher than expected. Maybe she could offer customized difficulty runs. Easy? 
No side bonuses and minor threat normal. Random chance of some events and room guardians. Even if they don't go all out. Then hard. Delta tried not to think about hard. What Muffet was doing, Delta didn't have to tell her to do. She was slowly making Kimmy keep up with her webs and slight leg scratches that she inflicted on the others. A few times she made a charge at Kemi, and the girl was slowly becoming more likely to strike back or use a barrier then bounced Muffet back. Delta pretended not to notice that Muffet dramatically rolled when she bounced off Kemi, as if showing the others that Kemi's power was stronger than it seemed. Muffet shouldn't be playing favorites, but Delta wasn't going to stop her. It would be so hypocritical of her. Eventually, Muffet went down, letting Dio's blade sink in, making her form explode into orange mana. The orange dust began to swirl and Delta raised an eyebrow, as she felt Muffet's loose soul weaving the mana together in her own. A single item fell after Muffet was done. A web cloak that was human-sized, on the back it said, I beat Muffet and all I got was this cloak. There was a beat. There's loot in this dungeon. Kemi said confused. I thought it was only puns, Grim muttered, and he looked utterly confused. I don't even get the joke, he yelled with his own tongue. We should go alphabetically in order so that we can get a fair turn and won't fight, unless it's something really important. Then we can see the need vote. Dio beamed at his group. Screw fair. I got dice and whoever rolls the highest gets it, Grim sniffed. But he put into his pockets and rolled them, and froze midair. Even Delta was surprised. Kemi's eyes glowed. Faulty dice is dishonest, she said, and Grum blinked. They're my ancestors' lucky dice. Who always won with them. He trailed off and then went red. Oh, okay. Those are getting burned, he sighed. Delta felt bad. Kemi smiled softly. Don't worry. Mighty Dungeon Delta, we request a fair and just dice. She called, Delta looked at her, and not the pavement. Uh, Kemi, I'm not sure what you... She began, and then began to feel like something was stuck in her nose. The dungeon shook, just a little. An orange manor circled in the room, rapidly forming into an object. Delta sneezed, and there was a flash. That's not dice. Aminster pointed out, and the floating screen was all their names. The word flashed. Combat rating. Kemi began to grow in a soft golden bar, which outpaced the rest. The always red Aminster was a pale green, and Poppy was purple. Grim was an orangey brown. Grim's bar was the smallest. Another word appeared, teamwork. Kemi's rose higher, as did Dio. More words flashed, and Delta stared. She had a perfectly logical and controlled system function as a random loot roller, and her normally safe and stable monster creation and upgrades were random instead. As the ratings flashed on, Grim did outpace Poppy and the system rated for the total effort given, and then Amonster the system judged on the total potential used. Grim nearly matched Dio. The board flashed and turned to a familiar blue. Dio, your big heart is the only outsized by the headache you give. Poppy, I swear you make entropy look active. Amonster, do something exciting for once. I keep forgetting your name. Grimoire, have a snicker. You do good for someone whose name sounds like a mountain far away. Kemi wins the loot review. Any complaints should be given to the nearest menu that cares. Hint, it's not this one. Delta gaped. Your name is Helen Kemia. Amonster asked the girl and looked pained. Call me Kemi, she whispered. It's a nice name, Dio said excitedly, as the cloak floated to Kemi. Grim was looking at her with wide eyes. He looked upset. Why are you called Curse on Our Love? He said, and the room went quiet. Dart frowned and the word translated slowly now that she focused on the board. The word was from odd language that put in the end of the meaning in the middle and the word of the phrase with the details following. Hell, of course, a, and there was close to an on, but the translation wasn't perfect. It could be used in several ways to show ownership or direction of the subject, so it was on and our, depending on where it was used. Kemi was love. So, Kemi was love. Holy crap. Delta could translate things really well, so could Grimm. 
His tongue must be a conduit for the translation powers that Grimm learned. Shame that he hadn't borrowed Dalta's tact. Because those who were in the monastery of truth are never lied to, I was given up because of an arranged marriage. My birth parents needed to present a firstborn male to command the family line. Without one, they would be seen as shameful. I was shameful. So they named me in the ancient tongue of the truth god and left me for the worshippers. There was nothing more to it, but having been named, the followers of my home could never lie to me and say that it wasn't my name. They didn't mean to be cruel, hence why they called me Kemi. She said quietly, What? Why is that so important? Amistad blinked, and Delta listened. It's like you and your dad. Strong blood carries on power. Those who are powerful or gifted parents often produce stronger children. A daughter meant that I'd be married off, and they would lose me to another family, or maybe a small connection or a piece of land. Not worth it when the dungeons are the most fertile way of making money. Kemi explained as she wrapped her cloak around herself. The thing was flowing with her white cloud robe. Powerful people, children, passing on strength. Oh God, Delta understood. These families were trying to grow their spores by breeding with other strong people. The thing that the siblings were trying to fix. And also, you cursed on their love. How about the blessing on the horrible souls? Kemi's bio parents were getting a strongly worded letter once Data exploded reality and let the mushrooms become all and one. Also, Delta focused on Kemi and saw that while the girl glowed and truthfully goddess and a strong kind vibes, in her song there was a firm pulsating black spore. Every second her orange mana flowed into it and took such an amount that a nanobot would have to squint to see it. That was going to take forever to remove. Delta tried to urge the manor, but she was told the system was locked due to the people being in the dungeon. Hmm. She knew the lost siblings made most life on the world, and hence why everything had a peace. People more than anything. So how could she go about scraping it off of people like she liked? Her mind was wandering in the orange wall that she had recently gotten. Delta knew that getting fresh mountain air was good for you, so maybe injecting it right into one's soul would work even better. She had to get Kemi down to the third floor, if her body could stand it. Delta paused. Groom and the others lacked manner and thus got overdosed. But why did all people struggle? What if the spores grew stronger and let them fight off the invasive manner trying to remove the spore? Could it be letting the dungeon manner damage the spore before going back outside to recover her, to let it regenerate and grow stronger? Was, was that why dungeons developed? Lower and lower floors to keep people inside longer, to develop stronger mana and longer duration to get their spores. Was that why people hit the apex or the prime of their power? Delta was having a slight panic attack. Wait. She had an idea. She would just keep doing what she was doing, like a Vegas casino with no clocks or windows. Delta would make them stay longer, because she wasn't kidding them, just emptying the evil god wallets so to speak. She went to speak with a quiet mushy who lingered in the tunnel and only then noticed that Vass hadn't taken part and but instead was delightfully sharing pottery tips with a regal mushroom. Delta stared for a long moment. Vass, she'd completely forgotten about him. The golem had been too busy being as still as a tree or a statue. Speaking softly to mushy, she cleared her throat and mushy repeated her words to the group. Delta says, that there is a free lunch for you all in the bar. Please remember to hydrate and feast for an hour before moving on, Mushy announced. It was time to show the lost brother what a real sport was. End of chapter. Chapter 108. How far will he go? The first major choice in the dungeon of Delta was not a good or bad, or to kill, or to play along, or to even decide to see if the rumors were really true about the oddness of this place. The first major choice of all people ended up facing, provided that they got to the spider room, was a simple idea, but devastating in outcome. The choice was left or right. Mushroom forest or singing nightmare, Grim Wade up their options. How about the pawn we can play? Hammondster offered, 
To which Theo rushed on with a fishing pole extended from his tiny hand. I shall feed us while you plan. Brains need smart fish food. He said, basically deciding for the group. It wasn't like anyone could say no now that he was looking away. It's that duck inside, Grum grimaced. Kemi frowned. Mr. Duck, he's very nice, but I don't think he's home. Kemi said sadly, Poppy, looking around. Looks a bit different than the last time I was here, she mused, pulling out her hood tight. The talking book was still making some sobbing noises. Spider guts, spider guts, all over my famous incantation for Moonlight Stag summon spell. At this rate, one is more likely to summon a Moonlighting Stag to the party. He whimpered, It'll come out once we leave the dungeon, Poppy. Where did you get that talking book? Is it magical? Grum asked. Voice interested Poppy gave him a withering glare. You're not allowed to hold Tom. I remember you eating the Manti and Manticore picture book. Yeah. Poppy never forgets, she said. We were five. Besides, I thought it was going to let me turn into a Manticore. Grum said with a sigh. Eat me and I'll use your blood to form a new spell called Banish Brithering Buffoon under the light of the red moon. You know, it's deadly if it rhymes. Tom the book warned darkly. But how do we sit and plan? Dio is already working. Amonster offered. Vass hummed as he went to sit next to Dio and to watch him work as a flash of silver rippled near the surface of the pond. A large golden fish taunted Dio from the far side of the beach to surface. Dio gave a large yank and a large rock flew out of the pond, landing behind him. Dio just cast the line again cheerfully. I'll get you, he laughed at the teasing fish, who seemed to be excited as Dio at the prospect of fishing. Kemi waited until Grum pulled out his map. Very good detail. You have a hand for cartography, she said, impressed at the detail and the notes made by Grum. The boy just blinked, looking confused. It's just a basic map with ideas and potential areas for change. Most maps are good for dungeons, but Dalta's dungeon changes in ways I'm not sure anyone can predict. The spiders have uh, five to eight gimmicks alone for the first room. That's insane, Grim shrugged. You haven't met the dungeon map makers. Fair play enchant their maps to auto feed information back to the key map. And so, if people discover new areas, it's really forcibly given to the company. By the time people have enough confidence to make their own, and the lucky hidden rooms found by the Greenhorns are taken away. And official makers sell portions for single form maps that have an expiry seals. Some are downright basic unless you pay a premium for a map that shows traps and secret passages. This is all even if the makers put enough effort into more than just squiggles. If people come here, don't be afraid to market your skills. Even I can see that your drawings are really good, and they take notes are very easy to understand. Kemi smiled. Grim still looked baffled. Why would I force people to pay to look at my maps? Sure, for Dalton it's fine, but any other dungeon is dangerous. I could just be sending people to die, because I tried to make a few coins by haggling and showing them where the traps are. Dungeons are stupidly dangerous, Grim protested, outraged. He huffed once. It's, uh, not what adventuring is about. It's the rare items and glory. I can't do that if my maps are soaked in blood, he said with a mutter. He shot Dio, look the boy, still having his back turned to them. That's not what we promised, and I don't want to betray promises. Now, do we want to try the secret passage facing the demon mouse, or do you want to go into the forest via the mudroom? He said, his tone making sure that the subject was changed. There was a pause before the oar began to blot. In the dark tunnel, a golden fish was having the time of its life as it gently lured the human boy's hook down into the space. The hook was so blunt and capped with a weird spongy thing that it would never catch anything. The fish wasn't sure that the boy knew how to fish. Really. It was a bit cute. It gently let the hook be pulled through the tunnel. It reached the surface not far away, and then it had to flop a little to get the hook into place. Being a dungeon creature, breathing was possible in both land and water. But it was a creature, so it mentally counted to 30 before it would play dead. Still, it was enough time to get the hook set in place and tug slightly. The line began to reel in, and the fish followed with glee. So it's settled, we'll try the challenge and secret boss. 
Scrum announced, Dio was grunting as he yanked hard on the fishing pole. Something was resisting even with his enhanced strength. With a mighty explosion in the water, a giant purple clam soared out into the pond and landed a distance away. That wasn't in the lake. Vast stood up curiously. Dio puffed and panted as he cheered. I clam this treasure, he hooted. Kimmy gave him a small giggle at the joke. The clam slowly opened itself to reveal the... Grim made a small noise. Is that loot? Amster blinked. Piles of coins, small gems, hardened amber, some fancy-looking piles of water crystals, and some hunks of metal, and a string of poles glimmered at them. I'm happy as a clam, Grim sniffed and ran over. Kemi raised her hand, but Amster put it down for her. Sometimes you have to let nature take its course, he soothed, and one of his eyes pulsing a sickly green for a moment as he shook his head at the glam. I feel a kinship to this thing. It holds value inside. Its outside is deceptively a normal thing. It has become a chest of the sea. I feel pride in my fellow container. Vast bowed in restraint. Grim can have it. I'll get a fish. Grim didn't have anything to eat before coming down since he was so excited. Dio smiled and turned away. Grim, lifting the coins that had a hard look, smiling at the crystals, he saw a big ruby but at the back and he leaned in to pick it up. Then the clam snapped down, eating Grim as the boy's legs began to kick wildly in panic in the air. His voice went so high-pitched that Poppy snorted. I dare say I know a clam opening spell, but unusually it is reserved for fancy parties and oysters. I doubt it'll work on this clam since this seems to have swallowed a pest. Tom said dryly, Kemi stood up with a chiding look. We must rescue our teammates immediately, not just when we feel like it. She reminded them and went over to the clam, unsure what to do for a moment. Mr. Clam, may I have him back? she asked. The clam shell shook, making Grim say something bitter, left unmuffled. Kemi thought about it before she saw the two googly fake eyes on top with a rattling comedy. Is he worth this? she tried, holding out a coin. The clam shook again. Kemi doubled her offer. The clam visibly began to vibrate, but still shook in disagreement. Kemi went for the kill and pulled out a third coin. The clam spat Grim out like a nasty snack and a long tongue extended to eat the eager motions. Like a weird dog of sort, Kemi paid the price for Grim, which she thought was rather cheap. The clam swallowed the coins, the tongue rolling back like a carpet, and then it shook as if mixing them with its treasure. After a moment, a slip appeared between the two and pressed shells, and Kemi pulled it out with confusion to read it. Fortress Pass for One, she read. Grim was staring at the ceiling, looking covered in a thin layer of clam slime. He also held a pass. One free drink at Ferris Bar, he croaked. What a treasure, Amster said to Poppy, who hid a smile. There were splashes as Dio gave a cry as all of the fish in the pond. Besides, the gold and silver fish somehow got tangled in his line at once. I did it, he said to Grim. Why is it always me? Grim asked no one. I am to tell you, young man, that the clam slime has a high use in alchemy. Also, the pass is for any one drink, not just a common drink. You may think on its value later. Mushy helped Grim to his feet. Any recommendations? Grim asked with a raised eyebrow. Try the Delta surprise shot. I heard the results can be hairy, but interesting. Mushy smiled kindly by twitching his moustache. What are these passes for? My team never made it past the Grove Place, Kami asked. To get a rest and a drink, one was first past the goblins, and even playing lightly, goblins do not play nice. Mushy warned and pointed to her pass. These are passes which show you accept the goblins' mercy and they'll let you pass, he added. How bad can the goblin room be? Poppy mused, Grim turned to her, face serious. Deadly, there's three of them, and one. Billy, Grim said with a fierce expression. New enemy, Poppy asked, almost expecting the answer. No, not exactly. He's a goblin who uses tools and special arrows. He was good. I want to see if I can take him on one day, when I get my own gear going, Grim mused. Billy has, uh, how should we say, gotten a makeover. 
You might find him to be a challenge more so than normal, Mushi warned before he covered his face. Ah, I shouldn't have said that I'm letting things slip, he grumbled, and then he winked at Grimm. I have a feeling that he is looking forward to your return as well. He's said to be a more serious young man. Poppy, Hamster, you take Swat, Dio, and Vas can take Num, and me and Kemi will get Billy. Grimm looked around, seeing that there was any objections. We'll pass, Kemi reminded. Besides, have you gotten the memo? There's like three different ways to do everything in this place that don't involve fighting. You gotta adapt. Hamster said as Dio handed him a cooked fish from the campfire as he started. Grum, I bet you can outsmart the goblins and they won't even know it. You're the smartest guy round. Dio said no hint of doubt. Grum stared at him before he swallowed audibly and looked away sharply. Yet, I keep messing up. So, it's not worth much, he said frustrated, and Dio actually frowned. The red head walked over and gently turned Grimm's head so that he was looking at him. No hiding your words. You've spin further than anyone here. I... He cleared his throat and everyone went still as Dio spoke, as softly as he could. I believe in you. You never looked down on me or thought that I was uh, stupid. That's why you'll get us through. Even when the other kids were scared of me, you weren't because you said my strength was like that of a hero. So, that makes you a hero to see heroes. I have no fear. Dio grinned, and Grum blinked once, very slowly. You almost went ten seconds without yelling. I guess if you can do that, then I can get us through this dungeon, Grim snorted, and gently pushed Dio's hand off of his shoulder. Stop touching me. You got fish slime on your hands, and I'm already clammy. He huffed, and he eyed the fish. Bah, dumb fish, he grumbled. The mudroom honestly hadn't changed too much besides the fact that the platforms had seemed to have shifted position, making what Grimm knew to be correct path from before look wrong. He simply went back, got a few rocks from the pond room, and threw them to see which shook and which didn't. He went first to make sure that nothing was going to appear. As he touched the first one and waited to observe the room, slow moving poles emerged from the wall on both sides of the mudroom. Blunt poles intent on pushing him off of the platform. He jumped to the next one and the poles froze for a moment before it continuing. Grimm continued to the one side and the poles sank back into the wall. Honestly, it was the least dangerous thing in Delta's dungeon so far. Grimm had a feeling that it wouldn't stay in that way for much longer. When his group joined him, after having to stop Vass from diving into the mud in curiosity, they waited at their new challenge. The Mushroom Forest. Kemi whispered. Her voice was tinged with something odd. Grim gave her a look as she spotted around. Kemi smiled weakly. It's fine. Last time we messed up here and caused more damage than was acceptable. She bowed her head. Grim wanted to ask for details. He held his tongue. Why are you hiding your tongue? Poppy asked, sounding like the answer wasn't something that she actually wanted to know. Grim blinked as his own fingers were holding his orange tongue. He released it slowly. A bad joke, he said between his gritted teeth. Dio and Grum took the lead, but before they got too far, pop-up menu appeared. Grum watched it appear and wondered how useful something like that would be for himself. Something to tell him how skilled he was or his vital strengths. It would be like a secretary on magic steroids. Hello, darklings! The screen was dark blue and it wasn't static. It moved slightly side to side. Didn't some of the challenge boxes act oddly last time? Grimm struggled to remember thematically. Hello! Dio said back calmly. Kemi bowed as Poppy merely nodded. Amster didn't move as Vaz was hugging some large mushroom stalk. Tom, the weirdo book, began to flap. Excuse me, a dungeon should not be able to communicate with so few levels. This could be a trap. Poppy, burn it! The book sniffed with disdain. The box turned to it. A talking book is even weirder. Do not throw stones in your glass manner. Besides, you know nothing about this dungeon or Delta. A shame. I would love to learn what you do know. But I fear that we really don't accept junk tributes if the epic can be helped. Grim held back his comment, enjoying the sound of the rude book spluttering at the offended manner. 
How dare you, you insolent piece of programming. I know things that would make your snooty little screen corners curl. A shabby thing like you could never hold up to my paper. Mana screens, pa! Nothing will replace the power of paper. Tom shot back. The sound of the obsolete is so sad. Imagine having to be carried from room to room by hands to be of use. Imagine needing to use someone turn your pages for information. I dare say I have never been so something so uh, quaint. Grimm wasn't sure whether the pride of waving had come from, but both the book and the screen were now up in arms. Well, as best as they could since they had none. Ah, uh, we're here on an adventure, Cammy called out softly. Both Tom and the screen turned to Cammy. Right. Of course, this is beneath me, Tom huffed. Dio looked a little lost. He was expecting because while the screen had words, Tom did not have such means of talking. He was all sounds. Grimm would tell him the words later. He knew Dio would never ask himself in fear of being a pain, which was in itself a pain. But Grimm had gotten used to Dio, always happy to help, slow to be helped. It was annoying. Right, so this is a challenge I added myself. I am new, the trap master, darkness of the dungeon, hater of puns, the blue to orange, the calm to the chaos, the sign maker. What's the challenge? I thought beforehand, and the challenges were to be ignored for the sake of the pure run, Amister asked lightly. The challenges they were about avoiding fighting were to be ignored. This one is not like that. Should you choose to accept it, an enemy will be allowed to access this grove to add a flavor of the challenge. A new window appeared. Bow to the arrow, a stalker amongst the shadows will appear and pepper you with traps and tricks to slow you down. Pin the shadowy tricks to down and earn an extra reward. Grim's eyes went wide. Arrow, could it be? Same rules, I guess, no lethal stuff or... Amister went on, Grim's heart began to beat faster. Of course, but safe doesn't mean painless. After all, people do silly things for a thrill. Amster looked around. Grimm could see him weighing up everyone's opinions. Last time we were here, we kind of got chased by spiders, so it was a bit chaotic. What do you guys think? Take it on or not? He posed the question as if he was too unconcerned to answer it himself. Is the room guardian still able to interrupt us? Kemi asked New. Of course, but do try to avoid repeating your last attempt. Bori is a lazy thing, but even he'll get worked up if you set him on fire. Everyone turned to give Kemi a non look. The girl did her best to sink into her cloudy robe's collar. Wah, no, the dent mumbled through the material. Let's do it. If we fail the challenge, then we just move on anyways. Failing the challenge isn't the end, Dio proclaimed, being brightly. Dio makes loud sense. Better to try and fail than to not try at all, Grum nodded. If Dio wants to, I'll help, Poppy said. Her voice was just a bit warmer than before. Grimm would have used her crush on Dio to rope her in more groups. But honestly, blackmail didn't make success in a team. It made Grimm end up in some trap where he was defenseless. Bribery, never blackmail, that was Grimm's motto. I'll help, I'm here to give support, Kemi agreed. Vast looked over. I can help, he hummed. Grimm would like to see that. So far, the golem had been spacey and hanging out with the sun and mushy, who followed them like a security guard. As a necromancer, I should be going against the sheep mentally, but be an individual. But as a friend, I don't mind helping out, as long as you all accept my silently rebellious attitude towards the group. Amster nodded seriously. I, Dio, force you into this group for mutual benefit. Dio pointed out. Amonster sighed deeply, as if in great conflict before he shot Dio a grin. Thank you for your understanding of my antisocial behavior. He bowed a little, and Grimm decided that they were all weirdos, and it was a good thing that they had him in command. A logical and calm leader. Let's accept the challenge to fight the assassin in an environment that we can't control, along with the guardian lurking in the room for the chance at some unknown reward. Grimm said with a grin. Y yay? Kemi tried to cheer, but her voice cracked a little. The waiting box vibrated. Good luck, little ducklings. Then new vanished. The grove seemed to shift, shadow shifting, extending and deepening in the darkness. The ceiling went from illuminated to almost misty. 
cheerful mushrooms that grew high above suddenly loomed a little. The lights from the ceiling moss vanished, and the glowing mushrooms that looked like stars in the room grew stronger, but almost more focused, like wispy ghosts in the mist. Looks like my room, Amster said conversationally before he amended himself. Minus the mushrooms, he corrected. Grim, step four, don't let your guard down. If that pig doesn't ram us, the archer is waiting. Dear, front and center, you slow down or distract where you can. Amster, can we back him up with buffs and control spells? Poppy, if I draw fire, we'll lure him within range so that you can take them down. Abandon the plan if one side is overwhelming, or we simply begin to lose. Delta gave us this chance so that we better act like it is a proper skirmish within the rules. It is better to run away and try again than to die for nothing. Grim drew a dagger from his side. So serious Amster grinned before wiggling his hands. From some pouches around his belt white dust flowed around Grim until it formed a rough white armor. Grim touched the heart and horns as it settled on his head. Is this, he hesitated, it's dust mixed with chalk, dead skin is dead. Amister shrugged, already turning to cast the same spell on Dio. How are you controlling chalk? Kemi blinked. Amister gave her a smile. What's chalk made of? I'll just give you a hint, it's similar to bone. He hummed and Grim had to admit that he hadn't thought Amister was so crafty. Skeletons, zombies, and all that rot. He pinched himself for the bad pun. He expected, but dead skin and chalk. That was impressive. Anything else you want to surprise us with? Kemi inquired. Vast tilted his head as he listened. I've never had to sweep my room, Amster said slowly. He can heal bone breaks and some flesh wounds if he wants, Poppy said bored. I won't stand for much rude accusations thrown at me with vile arts. I would never heal. The necromancer promised, but then hesitated. But do tell me if you hurt yourself, he added quickly. Grim snorted and stepped into the line with Dio as they faced the misty grove. His dagger flashed as Dio readied his sword. He briefly felt the support near behind him. The truth will protect us and free us, Cammy said, her hands glowing. Poppy let Tom float in the air as her hands slowly extended into claws. I guess I can try a little, she stated. Amister chuckled and it sounded darker than usual. I'd love to see how my arts measure up to the dungeon like this, he said lightly. Let's have fun, Dio ordered without looking back. Missing the total vibe going on, Grim shook his head. Let's go get some epic loot, he told the group, taking a step forward. Mila, Holly and Pick stood before the gate of Durin's that led inland. Well, isn't this lovely, Pick grunted at the sight of the three figures approaching as the last of the sun rays finally vanished. He raised his hand in time to stop a blade that seemed to almost blur into existence. Pick eyed it with annoyance. The mad-eyed loon holding it leaned in. So it's true, the boogeymen live. Zane grinned with glee. Pick leaned down and snapped the blade in two with a single snap of his teeth. He crunched as the royal knight backed off a step, discarding the sword without a look. Tastes like crap. Standards have really gone down in the last few years over there, huh? Pick said between bites of grinding metal that sparked and crunched. The other two walked calmly up and Holdy spat on the ground. Well, if it isn't something that stinks worse than the foulest mold cheese. He grunted to Mila, who twirled an arrow without taking her beautiful eyes off a pearl hole. The jolly, plump-looking knight who eyed them with what could be seen as kindness, but with enough idea of who she was that they saw it for what it really was. Excitement, bloodlust. Mila dropped her spain, holding the vile and picked the devourer. I can't believe we get such a warm welcome. The woman giggled. Give me a minute and I'll get my ex-husband here. I'm sure he knows some warm places that you belong in. Mila said coolly, but Hall frowned and made a show of counting slowly. Oh, speaking of exes, one little criminal, two little criminals, and three little criminals, I swear there used to be more of you, Pearl Hall said in a mock confusion. The woman grinned as Mina appeared at her neck, with a wicked dagger drawn. Say his name, just say it, and I'll cut you and your cowardly king to down into chunks for my daughter to use as fish bait. Do carry on. Pahol the glutton, Pahol the cannibal, Pahol the world eater, Pahol the pig. 
Mina pushed the knife, and Pohal's kindly manner vanished, and something closer to leering wolf eye appeared. My apologies, I did not intend to insult the dead. Pohal smiled, Mila turned her knife and vanished. The last one was looking at them with slightly wide eyes. Holdy eyed him. Who's the green sprout? He asked, not bothering to show off his stuff. He saw how neither Pohal or Zane looked directly at him. Al, introduce yourself, Pohal said like a patient mother. I'm Al, Alpha, I'm the apprentice to Pohal. He said blandly, and his brown hair looked average and brown eyes struggled to meet Haldi's own. A good lad. I thought that I would bring him along here to remind him of the scary things in the world that can still eat him. Bahal licked his lips. I'm surprised you haven't. Did you find an orphanage on the road to act as a snack? Mila asked bored. Then Mila's smile turned wicked like a dagger. Oh, I forgot the king's little pets aren't allowed to break the law. Tut tut. That's too bad. You must just be dying to take a bite out of something. Mila shrugged her white shoulder. The things people do because they can't read the fine print. She smiled at Pick, who grinned back. Zane and Pohol narrowed their eyes, but before they could respond, a feeling of intense pressure settled on them all. The earth groaned, the trees and plants began to twist in anger. Birds began to troll in fury, rats appeared with rage in their features, and the insects by dozens followed their hiding spots. Mila turned to see Holly Debergast walking down the street, her usual motherly aura replaced by a sickly green glow. Utter hatred and blackness filled her eyes. The whole speeches went sour for the first time. So, uh, this is where she went, she sighed. Black brambles rose up and began to cover poor Hull's legs, wicked thorns digging deep but not breaking skin despite their effort. Poor Hull put on the most pleasant smile that she could manage. Hello, Holly. I haven't seen you since I ate your family and home. Poor Hull waved cheerfully. A large dragon made of wood and snarling roots covered the thorns and broke through the ground and swallowed poor Hull whole. The child was nearly swallowed, but Holdy had him by his side within a second. The cheese doubled torn to pieces by the switch. The dragon was alone and serpentine, lithe and growing a great tree. Zane yawned and walked past. I'm going for a drink, he said casually, ignoring the scene. Holdy frowned, since he didn't even bother taking Al. It's okay, they just have some history to sort out. Your master is a bit of a... Holdy trailed off, not really wanting to upset the child. Monster? Alpha provided. Well, yes, but Holly is no saint herself. But Hall was the last resort, and things got a little out of hand. Holly sighed. The dragon trembled before cracking in the middle, and the sap covered per hole chewed her way out with gusto. Can you do something? She's basically ripping off your style. Mila asked Pick. I chew, she eats. Totally different, he argued. Come um, now, let me get you a room while Mila stops them. I dare say things will be tense for a while. Haldi ushered Alpha, who put up no resistance. Won't they die? Alpha asked, not sounding worried, but merely interested. No. Holly grows, poor Hull consumes. Holly bleeds her, and poor Hull heals. Holly has the world on her side, but poor Hull eats the world. It's a nasty cycle, but they both know how this ends. Holdy said, trying his best to appear harmless. This holly should level. It would be better for all involved, Alpha finally concluded. I'm not sure she can just level. She is pretty experienced, Haldi mused. I can show her grinding strategies. Perhaps she merely needs some tips, he shrugged. But Hall is useful, but I think that she is rapidly becoming more trouble than she is worth at this point. He finished quietly. You get some bonuses for working with her. Extra pay or, Haldi asked curiously. She gives the best rewards, besides a few. Alpha said finally. You don't mind me asking, Haldi made sure, nor wanting to upset some poor kid. No, dialogue options are normal. As a faction opposed to Bohol, you wish to gouge my affection rating with her. I can tell you that it is business relationships of using and being used. I am open to better offers if I find some, Alpha stated plainly. Haldi's eyed the kid for a moment. You're too serious, loosen up and have some fun. Come on, I'll show you around. Maybe you can find some better offers. No one deserves per hall. He said kindly, and Alpha eyed him dubiously. What do you want? He asked, and Haldi blinked. 
Nothing. You are new, a decent kid so far, and eager to get away from Poor Hall. Let me show you around to save you time. He said again. Alpha stopped. You must want something in return. Ask, and I will do it. Alpha said, and Harley itched his nose. Ah, uh, eat this cheese and tour with me, he tried, and Alpha actually furrowed his brow. Can I reward me and then reward me again? I need a task that you need doing, and I'll do it for a reward, he explained to Haldi. I just want to help, kid, Haldi promised. Everyone wants something. It is the nature of people. Everyone wants something from me, Alpha said with an absolute conviction in his voice. Why can't people want to help you? Aldi tried and Alpha looked around as if trying to pull an answer from the air. I can't allow people to go with me or help me. I go wherever I'm told these places are not safe. And even if you are uh, Aldi the vile, I must grow on my own strength or I'm pointless. So give me a task or at least direct me to someone who will. Alpha asked again. That's sad, kid. Who told you that? Aldi frowned seriously. I am Alpha. I am the first stage. I am the practice run. I have to keep being useful. It's just how I work. Alpha shrugged and turned to look for people. Alpha looked at a certain space, fingers touching something before he pulled his fingers back. Visit each public building in Durance and report me to their names, Haldi said quietly, and the boy sagged with relief. Thank you. The pair set off again with the giant wooden dragon, exploded from some four-armed purple-skinned warrior, doing her best to devour it. Sis rubbed her face as best she could. She leaned back in her chair with the four screens hovering before her. Two were yellowish, showing middling progress. The fourth was blazing green with a full stream mode. Delta was always working hard. The first screen was red. She eyed the pings and messages left in Alpha's inbox. It was reaching truly obscene numbers. The boy was simply not opening letters that she sent. At first, she thought that he was ignoring Sis, but she had been the box open and the boy staring at them as if they appeared. She was worried. Alpha was afraid of them from the potential of something Sis would say. It was bizarre. He opened EXP notifications and similar prompts, but direct input was skipped. Alpha's menus was a bog standard interface with information giver. Nothing like new. Hardly anything was like new. But from the signs that she got from Data, Sis peeked up to try to figure out what was wrong. Sis was beginning to think that Alpha was thinking Sis would fire him. It was so weird, and without the direct contact, Sis couldn't force the four to obey the force of them to listen. She herself had programmed the system to avoid that. Sis was the same now. But all it took was one day of impatience since Sis might try to direct things herself, and the slope would only end up in sadness. That was not how this project was about. It's let Sis be the conundrum since Pro was set to not updating the four about each other. Brother really set himself apart on the stubborn path. So Sis knew that he would never tell one of them about the rest. Brother was respectful of the rules like that. <sighs> She never felt so useless. Sis would never want Alpha to fear them. Sis had only tried her best to make them safe and ready. But to think that she caused such a terror in one of her charges. Sis felt like a failure. Wow, you're dramatic, New said in the sat nearby in the blue-hued human form. He looked closer at the late teens at the childish form from before. So Alpha's kind of blocking you and you're not allowed to tell Delta. Eat. New smiled. Sis froze. How long have you been there? She whispered. New hummed. Oh, you know, long enough. I got to go and uh, do stuff, you know. Many things that I've sort of jailbroken. But I'm still happy to do. Toodles. New waved over his shoulder. Sis looked over her shoulder carefully before she quietly fist pumped into the air. Yes, she whispered. Delta's daltonness had dalted a loophole for Delta to cause a more daltery things. Sis was so shocked, surely she had no idea when a being entered her dimension, let alone hear her thoughts and worries. Sis was so shocked. She giggled nervously. This wasn't breaking the rules, but she still felt kind of excited to be making trouble for once, instead of brother. Brother is going to be so impressed that Sis has manipulated someone. End of chapter and that, my friends, concludes this batch video. If you wish to support the author or this channel, the links are down below. 
And, as always, I'll see you in the next chapter. Have a good one. Cheers.